when I was four, and usually that's the moment where if a speech starts like this, you're like, oh no, <laughs> this is gonna take a while. But I can promise you it's not gonna take more than 17 minutes and 42 seconds. So, um, when I was four years old, I started playing the violin. And by the time I was six, uh, I was pretty good at it. And I was going to this uh, national contest, competition. And around that time, um, there was this local Young Talents competition in uh, Oradia, where I come from. And uh, I was doing my piece, the violin, everything was going great. And at some point, I dropped the bow. And I was like, okay, pick it up, continue playing. Da -da -da. Finished, finished the song, everything was great. And what do you know, surprisingly, they decided to give me the first prize. And I still have, it's a glass cup of some sort. And uh, looking back uh, over this experience, I realized that um, why did they, what, what did they see there? Uh, because I didn't perform perfectly, uh, I'd, I'd had that event. Uh, and thinking about that, I think they might have seen, uh, I don't know, maybe courage and determination and uh, just ability to pick something up and go on. And I think I was fortunate to, uh, to be rewarded for that. So this kind of stuck with me. Um, then, by the time I was, was eight, and actually there were two major events that happened in my life when I was eight years old. One of them is that uh, my birth father, he passed away, and he was an amazing musician. Uh, he used to travel the world, uh, especially Europe, uh, playing, uh, playing the cello, playing the flute, the piano, everything. And uh, he passed away in a car accident, uh, getting back home. And this obviously changed my life. The second thing that changed my life when I was eight was I, I had seen for the first time in my life a computer. And I don't remember exactly where I did it, but I know that a few minutes after seeing it, I was instantly hooked. I, I knew this was it, this was what I was going to do. And because my family couldn't afford to buy one, um, I said, okay, I'll call upon the higher power. <laughs> and I prayed, I prayed to God that he gave me a computer. And what do you know, uh, less than a year later, uh, out of the blue, <laughs> uh, I got a computer, a gift from a friend. And uh, together with the computer came a programming book in English. And that's how I got into computers. Uh, I started reading it, I started learning how to do stuff. And I was very fortunate to have by my side, to have my uncle, which was just finishing computer science, uh, his degree. And uh, he was the first that taught me the basics, taught me how to think, taught me how to approach problems. And then, looking over the following years, he was the one that always steered me in the right direction. He always uh, took me to the next level. And I'm very fortunate and I'm very grateful for him. I'll always be. Then, fast forward a few years, so it's going fast. Um, I'm finishing high school, getting to university, like everyone does. I was, always, I was already doing freelancing by that time. Um, I was doing programming, uh, web development, all that stuff. This was 2002. And after about one year of university, I kind of decided to quit because I knew that, I mean, I saw what they were teaching there and it was old stuff. It was the same stuff my uncle was taught almost 20 years before. Um, it was irrelevant. It was, for me, it was a waste of my time because I decided to invest my time in something that I thought was valuable, which was learning, learning, learning the things I thought were good. Um, obviously, my family didn't, uh, they didn't support this decision and they, they convinced me to continue my studies, which I did, sort of. 
so I kind of finished uh, five years of university. Uh, I, uh, I took part at the graduation ceremony with a symbolic diploma, with the hats and all. Uh, I took the photos, which made my grandma very happy. Because my grandma, she had three things for me. She said, you have to finish college, you have to get an apartment and get married. So, working on, I, I have, let's say, one out of three until now. <laughs> um, for her, it's two, actually. Because she doesn't know that I didn't actually finish. <laughs> Um, yeah, and looking back over, over the last few years and over my life, I realized that my birth father, um, he had a great influence all, over my life and he was, let's say, an indirect mentor for me because whenever people were talking about him 5, 10, 20 years after his death, they were actually started. They actually started to cry, and this to me was. How, how can you explain that? It's only because he was an extraordinary man and the things he did. Um, and I said, okay, I, I want to get that. I want to learn what, um, how he was like. I want to be like that. Then I was fortunate to have a new father which is also a fantastic person. And uh, our relationship has been um, the one that two close friends have. And all the big discussions uh, we had together, uh, the discussion about girls, uh, about life, about aliens, about technology, about science fiction. And uh, he was... He had started doing his own business by the time I was in high school. And one of the best things he taught me was that doing a business, being an entrepreneur is hard. You don't just get the good part, the ones that you make your own schedule and all that, but it's hard and it takes work and it's painful. And I remember this one instance where um, he, was, he was building one of the first professional paint shop uh, in paint shops in Romania. It's actually, even to this day, I think it's the only one in Transylvania. And he had the building, he had everything except the main, you know, the painting cabin, which was the most expensive part, and he didn't have the money for it. But he did everything else. He finished the toilets, he finished... Uh, cleaning everything, everything, everything was spotless, just waiting for this large, huge uh, tools to come in. And my mother asked him, hey, what, why are you spending time and money finishing the toilets? I mean, you don't even have that, you can't even start your business yet. And he said one thing, which I always remember. He said that, do you think that when that thing will come in, do you think that I'll have time to finish up the toilets and prepare good working conditions for my men? No, I'll just start working like everyone else does. So I took this learning. Uh, I'm trying to see how it, I can apply it. Good. So, please, please raise your hand if, um, if anyone has a grandmother that was a racing pilot. Please raise your hand. If your grandma was a racing pilot? No? Nobody? <laughs> okay, I thought so. <laughs> because what I want to talk to you about today, actually, is that um, expecting, expecting schools to teach someone how to be great technologists is like expecting grandma to teach someone how to be a great racing driver. Right? Okay. And let me tell you why this is the case. Uh, there are several reasons for this, and uh, one of them, which is a very practical reason, is that by the time the books on technology are printed, by the time the ink dries, they're already obsolete, because technology changes so fast, and it's always changing, it's constantly changing, you can't keep up with it. That's a very practical reason, right? 
There's another reason, and I, this is a more a philosophical reason, and it's the reason, it's the principles behind education, which is highly theoretical, um, especially in computer science, right? Um, and that reason is how technology is perceived, because in, usually in schools, technology is perceived as you have wires, you have circuits, you have chips, you have lines of code, all this geeky, tacky thing that they teach. But that's wrong. And it's wrong because what, what you want, it's, it's wrong because it's just a small part of the bigger picture of what technology actually is. And that is a means, and technology is a provider of, it's a means to make our lives better through products like computers, hair dryers, uh, the wheel, everything is technology. And school, does, school doesn't teach you this holistic approach of technology as a whole. And does society require and does society need um, and demand highly skilled, professional, well-rounded technologists and engineers? Absolutely. But do the schools produce them? No way. And it's because of those reasons, especially. And what I mean through well-rounded technologists is that it's that person that understands that it's not about, it's not just what I'm doing here, uh, placing a chip on a board or writing lines of code every day. That's not all. What they have to understand and what we have to understand as technologists is that technology provides a product and the product, if the product is, is successful and is used by users, by people, by normal human beings, not necessarily geeks, it's a product that provides an experience of using it. So as technologists, we have to raise our head from the, I don't know, from display or whatever we're doing and understand that we're providing a user experience, basically. And this is something, there's this entire war going on between designers and programmers and technical people, and there's so much we can learn from each other. <clears throat> Also, you have, usually the way I see things happening naturally is that someone learns how to do something, they do it, they have success, and then they teach others how to do it themselves. And this, that's not the case in most education institutional. It's usually theory, people who have very good theoretical knowledge, but maybe they don't have even one day of real life experience. That's how can you teach something that um, you only know from books but not doing yourself? So I think a great role into fixing this is mentors, people who actually do things and then they start to teach others. And um, at Lateral, the company I work with, we, we started to look into internships and we wanted to bring young people and we wanted to try to be mentors for them. And we don't have a big company, we don't, we're not a big corporation, we don't have internship programs and we don't have processes that say how we deal with interns, no. So what we did was try to find extremely talented young people, students, and we did, the first one we did we found uh, last year uh, in November. And uh, I knew in the first minute, five minutes of talking to him, I knew this is the guy. And it's, when you talk to someone, you, you know if there's a core in there, if there's passion, if there's desire, if there's willingness to work hard and to really learn. And um, what we do is give them a challenge. We say, here's our proposal. We give you all the tools you need. In this case, we decided to build an iPhone application. We said, we'll give you a Mac, we'll give you an iPhone, uh, and you have one month to build a product, any product that you want. We actually asked the guy to come up with product ideas, which we discussed, and we, in the end, we arrived at one that we decided to build, and it's been a success. 
And then we repeated this process, and it's amazing to see how how they can people with no experience whatsoever, if they are brought in into an environment that supports them, and if people are willing to spend time with them, and that's what we're trying to do. We provide the support, uh, help them with planning, with making sure that they deliver. They have one month to deliver one product. That's it. So, this brings us to today's topic, today's theme, which is we're living in a new world with a new world order. And I just realized, thinking about this in the last few days, I realized that the new order is that there is no new world order, okay? <laughs> there is absolutely no new world order. There are no recipes that work anymore. The worn paths, the common sense, the common wisdom, not common sense, common sense is good, common wisdom, that's not working anymore. There are no algorithms for success anymore. What's important is that everyone finds their passion, finds what they are passionate about, finds what they are good about, finds what they love to do, and they do it. They laser focus on it and they do it. Because life's short, time is short, 30 seconds, right? And it's just, there's so much opportunity and it's a huge responsibility for each of us to find this and really make a difference. And there's so much good change that can happen in this world, so much innovation. So my thought for you guys is find what you love, laser focus on it and do it. Thank you. <laughs>